let's see here. Um, so last time when I was working on my Vectrix emulator, I had it to the point where I'm loading the BIOS um, and I'm running through the routines. So this is basically the CPU, this is my debugger showing the CPU instructions that are running. And it goes through a whole series of instructions. And at one point it gets, it gets into um, this kind of infinite loop here. It's uh, repeating the same two instructions over and over. Uh, what's happening is that the CPU is trying to check if at address D00D, um, it wants to know if a certain bit is set and the, or if certain bits are set. Now, if we look here, it's bits that are in the register B. So if I say info reg here, we can see that in B uh, address, um, we have the value uh, 40 in hex. So that means that the sixth bit is, um, is set and it wants to know if at address D00D, that bit is set. And here we can see that at that, at that address, um, the value is zero. And another way to do that is I could just print the value here and it is indeed zero. Now what is this this address here, dude, which is just an awesome name for an address. So in the Vectrex memory map here, uh, we can see, so I have here like basically the memory map, we can see that like from zero to seven FFF, uh, that's the, that's the cartridge ROM space, so that's where the cart uh, addresses map to, some unmapped data, and here at one point we have the 6522VIA chip, uh, and that's where D00D lies inside this address range. Now the VIA is basically the chip that the CPU talks to through these memory mapped registers to communicate with it uh, with the peripherals. So, for example, uh, the, the raster, or not, actually not raster, I should say the, the display, the, the vector display is controlled through these registers. Uh, there is also control for the joystick inputs or joysticks, because you can actually connect two of them. Uh, the audio is, uh, the audio chip is controlled through the VIA. And there's also some timers and stuff that you can hook into. So all of that basically is uh, exposed to the CPU via these, this, uh, here I wrote here, 16 bytes shadowed 128 times. So there's really 16 bytes of registers in there that we, that the CPU talks to. Now the thing is, I have here, like the beginning of an implementation for this VIA, which stands actually for Versatile Interface Adapter but it's pretty much empty. All it has right now is just this little array of those 16 bytes that we were talking about that are initialized to zero and when you read and write all I do is I just I just write whatever values to it and I just read back whatever, whatever values so I haven't implemented the VIA at all. Um, now I could do that but I'm still interested right now in continuing to implement my CPU because I'm not done implementing all the instructions for the CPU. So what I did last time is uh, if I write here H for help, I added this um, this command, where is it here? Uh, set, yeah that's it. Set address equ equals value. So this basically allows me to say, okay, let's just set, you know, dude here um, to, and I can put whatever value, I mean I can put the exact value it's looking for, like this, and now if I step, uh, it'll test bit B, and this time it'll actually be able to branch to, because uh, branch if equal to FC, which is F345, uh, in this case I guess it's not equal, so it went to F349, so that's actually what we wanted here. kind of funny. Branch if equal to, oh that's it. All right, it would have gone back, that's it, it would have gone back to minus 4 to F345 if it were equal, but instead it's not, so now we continue. And so now we can continue on, we're uh, past that, that instruction. So if I just continue, 
Now at one point I'll hit one of my my fail handlers and we can see why because it eventually got to a unhandled uh, instruction uh, neg a which is negate a so I need to implement that instruction now so that's that's where I was last time and that's what I'm hoping to work on today so let's look at what is neg a so I have here I'll just stop the debugger if I go to my CPU CPU.cpp. So this is where basically I'm implementing all the CPU instructions, and uh, I think I've got about, if I'd have to guess, somewhere about like maybe 60 to 80 percent of the instructions. I haven't actually counted them, but I should actually see how far I am. Anyway, so I have some good number of instructions in here. And now we want to look at neg A. So I have a CPU helpers. No, sorry. What is it called? It's a. Oh yeah, CPU opcodes. If I look for neg, negate, I've got neg A, neg B, regular negate for uh, addresses, the addresses in memory. So I can negate values in memory with different addressing modes. So direct, indexed and extended. Okay, so otherwise it's negate values that are in um, registers. So negate A or negate B. So that's what I have to work on right now. So to do that, I'll pull up my trusty MC6809 cookbook, which is this PDF of a, of a book that was written in 1980 for programmers to uh, program this specific CPU, and I've, I found this to be a pretty good, uh, good textbook. You know, it's, a, it's got like nice descriptions of the hardware and all that. Um, and I like just how, the way it presents the instructions. It's it's not too terse. It gives a few examples. So, for example, if I want to look for negate A, what I can do is I can search for negate A, make it match whole word and match case. And it shows that I only have six hits. So first hit actually, or second hit maybe. I don't know, first hit is in here. Oh yeah, there we go. Negate accumulator. That's neg A, neg B, and negate above is negate memory location. Perfect. So let's go to the next hit. So here we go. Um, so we'll start with this one, negate. So it shows here the way it's supposed to look. You say negate some Q. This is for the address. And what it does is it's effectively doing a 0 minus M. Right. So I wonder if I could just implement this in terms of my subtraction. I might be able to do that. Uh, and so it says here, replaces the operand with its two's complement. Right. Okay, so the C flag represents a borrow and is set to the inverse to the resulting binary carry. Right. Uh, note that, that 8016 is replaced by itself. Okay, 80 uh, hex is replaced by itself and only in this case is V set. Right. That makes sense because 80 means we have a 1 in the most significant bit. So, so to do the 2's complement would mean that we would end up with uh, 0, 0 and 1, so 0 in the least significant. Uh, sorry, 0 in the most significant and 1's everywhere, plus 1. Right. Okay, yes. And then the value 0, 016 is replaced by itself, and only in this case is carry clear. So it's really, okay, it's pretty straightforward. We can do some special cases there. And flag results. So here we're looking at the negative bit and the overflow bit. So it's like, it's equal to 1 if 0. What does this mean again? L zero equals M. 
trying to understand what, what they mean exactly here. Okay, I guess it's, it's right here. So negative is set if bit 7 of the result is set, as usual. Zero is set if all bits of the results are clear, as usual. Uh, overflow will be set if the original operand was, was uh, as I said, 80 in hex. And C is set if the operation did not cause a carry from bit 7 in the ALU. Carry is set if the operation did not cause a carry from bit 7 in the ALU. So when would that occur? Okay, so Lucas's plays is asking, I am like seeing the first time seeing this, so I don't exactly understand the command prompt. Is this running on an external hardware? Okay, so uh, Thanks for uh, for joining. Since the f your first time, I'll just I guess I can give a little rundown of uh, of what I've what I've got here so far. So basically, I'm implementing a Vectrex emulator. Um, so Vectrex is I don't know if you saw in, in my description, but it's basically this um, this machine that came out in like 1981 or so. Looks like this. It's a really cool machine because it was like a home console. You know, you would buy this, bring it home, and play with it. Um, and unlike most video games at the time, this one actually was a, a vector display. So, like, you know what? A little video can give you an idea of what that, that kind of looked like. It looks like this. Yeah, so simulating hardware, exactly, right? It's like a, just a regular emulator, like a NES or Super NES, Genesis, uh, N64 emulator. Um, I've written one emulator before, a, a Nintendo emulator, a NES emulator, which was really cool. Um, I love the NES, I grew up playing it, but I also grew up playing the Vectrex. It was a system I had even before I had my NES. Uh, I mean, I was really young, I was like six or something when I got it from my uncle. And uh, it was really cool. I actually still have it, it still works. Uh, yeah, and I just thought this would be kind of fun, you know, the challenge of, of emulating a, a vector display, I think that would be pretty interesting. I could explore uh, trying to, to do that, perhaps with some shaders. Um, but right now, it's still fairly early stages. I, um, I could show you a little bit what I mean, so here. So yeah, all this code is available on, on, on GitHub. But you can see here I've got like, you know, some some basic stuff going here. So uh, I've got my CPU, I've got this, let me just pin this here. Okay. So yeah, as I was saying, I'm right now looking at the CPU code, um, but I've also got, you know, something to wrap up with the cartridge. Uh, looks like, these are all devices that would be connected to the memory bus. So yeah, I've got, um, what else here, RAM. There's some RAM in the system. And the VIA chip that I was talking about before. So stuff like that. And here in my main application, where it's, again, really early, but right now you just call Vectrexy with a ROM. I'm not even yet at the point where I'm like loading anything from the ROM itself. Because the way the Vectrex works is that like built into the into the um, into the Vectrex unit is some ROM memory that contains um, the BIOS. So basically, a bunch of code that are kind of like kind of like an API, like a bunch of functions for games to use. So the game can like you know call into these functions, and then these functions take care of I don't know playing sounds or pulling input. Uh, or mainly to control the, the vector display. There's a lot of like functions for like resetting the X position and the Y position or setting them to different places and controlling how long it takes and all that. So this is like all exposed via this BIOS, which is a program. Um, and then another part of this BIOS ROM uh, contains an actual built-in game called Mindstorm. 
So, um, but I'm not even there yet. Right now, I'm just doing what the, the boot up process. So the boot up process for the Vectrex is to just start at a specific address, which is uh, right here, it's at 0xf000. Uh, located at that address is the first instruction of the BIOS routines. And the, what the Vectrex does is it starts executing them, and what it does is it just kind of sets up the hardware. Yeah, I got it now. That's going to be some long way to finish. I must say that I'm really interested in the progress. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not only working this on stream because I think it'll take a really long time to get through it, but every once in a while I like to... My idea is to come on stream and uh, just work on some little tidbit here and there, and hopefully that'll be interesting for some people. Um, maybe learn something or maybe get some help from people who see something interesting I could do differently. Um, and yeah, you know, kind of just share the process and have fun and make it kind of social. So, you know, that's what I'm, I'm hoping to achieve out of this uh, streaming this, this process. So yeah, so that's it. Like what you were asking about before is maybe now you understand more is that what we're seeing here in this console is my yeah. debugger. Yeah, thanks for the thanks for the follow, man. Lucas's plays. Um, yeah, so I have here like a, I have this debugger, so I can show you that here. So this is the debugger. It's actually pretty cool. I I, I wrote a, I sort of wrote a debugger for the Nest emulator, but it was not as cool or sophisticated as this as this one. I, I decided to go a little bit deeper on this one. Um, and what I did is I looked at how GDB works, and I'm not someone who actually used much GDB, like command line GDB, but I figured, you know, may as well use an interface that works and makes sense and that people have been using. And I looked at the uh, set of commands that GDB offers and, you know, took a subset of them that would make sense for my emulator and started implementing them. So, uh, and a big part of this debugger is being able to disassemble instructions. So you know I can read the the hex. You know I can read I can read the the binary data that represents the instruction stream for the CPU, but it's not really useful. It's useful to the CPU, but it would be useful for me to be able to understand what each instruction is, right? So uh, what my debugger really is doing, like if I say I take a step here, so I'm starting at address F000, which is the very first instruction of the BIOS routines, and I take a step. And here what I'm outputting is, of course, the, the address that, we're, that the instruction is at. This is the instruction, um, you know, the, the binary instruction itself, but this is actually in hex. So it's 10 CE CB CEA. And then this corresponds to, and this is where I disassemble it, it corresponds to this LDS instruction, which is load stack, load stack pointer. And it's saying, I want to load the, the stack or load the S, um, the S register with this immediate value. So now if I say info reg, which means show me the registers, we should see that S is indeed equal to uh, CBEA, which it wasn't before that. It would have been zero. I mean, we can, just to be sure there, I'll start and I'll say info reg. And there we go. So everything's pretty much zero. Take a step, info reg again, and there we go. We can see that the stack uh, register has been set to CBEA. Uh, well, I would say, so Lucas's play says, well, I would say that GDB is as strong as it needs to be for light debugging, but can handle some advanced techniques like watching a variable, etc. Yeah, exactly. So um, I, ha I don't have watching a variable, but I do have some cool stuff that I've implemented so far, things that help me while I'm developing the CPU, and I'll probably be adding more and more features as I need them. But for example, if I show the help here, uh, the kind of stuff I can do, of course, is a step an instruction, uh, continue running, run until a specific address, uh, show the information of the current registers, print uh, the value at some address, set the value at an address, 
So I have some breakpoint stuff, which is pretty cool. So info break displays breakpoints. I can say break address, and then I can delete, disable, enable uh, breakpoints by index. Um, so for example, like let's say we took a few steps. Like I know that I'm gonna, for example, hit F1 66, right? So if I restart, I can say break at address F F1 66. So it says added breakpoint at F1 66, and then I can say info break. So it shows me that I have an enabled breakpoint here with the label, the index zero. Uh, I can disable it. And then if I say info break, it shows me that it's disabled. And in fact, I also color it red uh, to help me see that more clearly. So if I enable it back, enable zero, uh, and then continue, it'll stop here, breakpoint hit at F166. Oh, I should probably put a little dollar sign there. Anyway, so that's the kind of thing that the break, uh, sorry, the debugger supports. I also have this cool little feature I added called load symbols. This is very particular to to my setup here, but it so happens that I have where is it again for the CPU? Um, some here the BIOS. Oh yeah, that's it. No. Oh yes, up here, BIOS source, that's it. So somebody actually disassembled and like commented the entire BIOS. So I can show you that here. If I can just pull it out, here we go. So this is the BIOS for, um, that I'm actually trying to, to run and so there's like for example that load stack instruction we saw the very very first one but instead of putting a value like an immediate value it puts here this nice little name vec default stk so set up the stack pointer and what this is is that at the very top here does this include vectrex inc and that is this file and in here you just it's just basically a file that sets up a whole bunch of nice names mapped to addresses so that then in the code, you know, it's just like regular defines. So um, yeah, so it's basically a whole bunch of defines. And I thought, you know what, it would be really cool if I could parse this and display these values instead of just the addresses when I'm debugging, because it will help me, right? So for example, I can actually do that now. So let's say I quit. So if I do load symbols, uh, load symbols put this path like that it says loaded symbols from there and now if I step you can see here that instruction before that just had this load stack with this immediate value now says vec default stack vec default SDK um, so that is really helpful like if I keep stepping you know we see here for example we jump to a subroutine called init OS uh, here we're loading into X the Vectrex sound shadow value, whatever that is. Um, we're jumping to a subroutine, subroutine named clear XB. Um, and more stuff like that. If I just continue. So this is where I was stuck before. And in here in the comment section, we can see that the address D00D uh, corresponds to the via interrupt flags and there we can see that it actually is part of that via chip that I was talking about earlier and in fact if I look in here for that exact flag via interrupt flags so via interrupt flags register we can actually see exactly what each bit stands for now this I don't parse I don't have this information in my load symbols but it's okay you know I can just take a look at it but we, were, we can see that earlier we were testing for this one, bit six. Uh, well, it is testing for that, right? So here, 40. So that's bit six. So it's basically looking for the timer one interrupt flag. So it's waiting to see when this flag, this timer one interrupt flag um, becomes one. So, and like I said, I'm not actually implementing it yet. So what I do now is I just say, well, we'll just set D00D 
to, I could put pretty much anything, so I could, you know, put 40 or put FF or whatever, just whatever it allows me to continue. And then I run and I get stuck, I stop on neg A, which is what I would like to implement right now. So hopefully that makes some sense. So all right, so let's let's keep looking at at implementing that. All right, so CPU opcodes. So the way I do this is I'll pull this on the side here, and then I'll open up the CPU here. Hey, by the way, just on, if you guys could let me know, can you actually hear my music? Because I know it's quite low, but I don't know if it's, or if it's, uh, is it too low or too loud or something? I have no idea. All right. Yeah! Wheel Smith, uh, thanks for follow. Thanks for the follow, man. All right, so let's see here. Neg, let's start with, let's grab some of these addresses. And go to the bottom here. Oh, maybe I'll put them after uh, jump here. Put them after subtract. It doesn't really matter where I put them. So I have this one. And this is addressing mode direct, so I'm going to implement opneg. And if I pass nothing, it'll know that I'll implement that as the from memory. Okay. Next one. 0x40. That'll be op neg, but this time from page zero, uh, instruction 40. It's unfortunate I need to repeat myself a little bit. Super interesting stream, man. A great find for sure. Ah, oh, thanks, man. Thanks, Will Smith. That's, uh, that's very nice of you. Uh, I hope you do enjoy the stream and feel free to ask questions, uh, just uh, hang out, talk. It's all good. So this one here, will take a uh, register A. So this will be an, an overload I'm going to implement that will actually take the, the register that we would like to negate. So this basically follows a pattern. There's a, a lot of instructions are very similar. Like for example, increment, we can see that there's that same pattern here where we've got like the increment for um, a memory address. And in this case, there are three versions because there are three different ways to specify the address that you want to increment. So it's the same thing for negate. Uh, and then there's also an increment for A and an increment for B. So that's the ones for specifically for registers A and B. Uh, these are 8-bit uh, accumulator registers, they call them. So it's basically like registers you just do math in and stuff. So um, looks like basically negate is following the same kind of pattern. You know, so I'm just going to Write these in. We've got here neg b. So that's 0x50. I'll just copy this. 0x50. B. Uh, next one is down here, 0x60. And that's basically the same as these ones. So I, I'm guessing there's just this one and one more left careful to put the same address and then I'll show you how I actually implement this so 0x70 again careful to copy that and I think that's it yeah now we're back to the top all right so that gets the calls ready so now I need to go implement opneg so let me go to uh, yeah, I'll go to op inc and I'll work right above it so yeah, it says as usual, like for increment, I'm gonna have two overloads, one that takes the accumulator register 
the 8-bit register and one that takes no register and determines which uh, which memory address to look up. So I could probably just yeah copy this and change it a little bit. Pop neg. This will be for neg A and neg B. And uh, we'll also have one for from memory, so no parameter. And this will just be from neg address. Okay. Oops. All right. Okay. So let's implement this instruction. So now, what would be the simplest way to do this? I was wondering if I could just use my because I have this subtraction. And then again, it's just two's complement. So I wonder if I could just negate the value. Yeah, I think I can just negate the value. And that should be good. Yeah, let's try that. So take the register and set it equal to minus reg. So it's an unsigned integer. Yeah. So we do that. And then we got to update uh, n, z, and v, and c. So here, yeah, I'm going to try and pull this to the side so I can stop alt-tabbing between the two. Put this over here. And... Why did that work? Oh, because it's in full screen mode, okay. There we go. Can do that. Okay, I can close this. Getting a little cramped in here. <laughs> okay. There we go. All right, so. And in here, we want to start setting our, our flag. So we'll set negative is if bit seven is set, so again, that's tip usual. So the same thing as here. Um, CC overflow. So here it says the set if the original operand was one zero 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 zero. So I kind of have two ways I guess I can do this. I can either check, what could I check? If we're all ones? But what I'll do is I'll just keep it simple and I'll just remember the um, original value. And I'll just say exactly what it wants here. So I'll say, if this value is equal to 0B1000000, I'm oh, sorry, equals. Yeah, there we go. I don't need that. Yeah, that's good. And zero is e easy. So that is if my current new value is equal to zero. And now the carry, so this one here I'm not 100% sure. Set if the operation did not cause a carry from bit seven. So carry, it's one. One if zero. What does this mean? Dot L O. Less than equal. Less than. Or? Not quite sure. Um. So what would cause the C flag represents a borrow and is set? Oh, here we go. So the C flag represents a borrow, and is set inverse to the resulting binary carry. Value 0016 is also replaced by itself, right? And only in this case is C cleared. So otherwise, C is set.
Lucas's plays. I think that equals has higher precedence than assignment. Oh wait, that's actually what you want. You mean in, in this here? Oh no, you mean in the, my code. Yeah, I'm, I mean, it, it's, it, I'm, I'll put it anyway, because I, I know I do it in some places. I'm a little bit, not super, uh, yeah, I'm not really consistent with that. Uh, but actually, equals equals, the comparison does have higher precedence than assignment. So yeah, you know what, I won't, I won't put it needlessly, although I seem to have done it in a few places. But to be honest, I'm gonna be refactoring this after a while. I'll probably, because you know, I'm copy pasting a lot of this code, I'm probably just gonna have like a calculate zero, calculate negative, and just call those functions everywhere. Um, but I'm just waiting for having to have a few more examples before I make that decision. Um, so I th if I'm reading this right, I think what it's saying here is that the, ca the carry will pretty much always be set, except in the case of zero. So basically, if the original if the original uh, value is not equal to zero, then it'll be set. I think I'm reading that right. I'll have to double check that. OK, so let's assume that's the case. Uh, for this version, it'll be very much, very similar. Um, so I'll just copy some code here. So what we want to do is, is we want to look up in my, um, figure out which addressing mode we intend based on the page and opcode. So this is like the, this specific CPU has three pages of of instructions, they, they separate them into pages. Um, there's page zero, page one, page two, and then for e on each page there is an opcode, which is a 16-bit value. Uh, so we, what we do is we use this. I have this function here to look it up, and it returns an entry, a const expert entry in this table. I can show that here, and that did not work at all. <laughs> all right. Here we go. Okay, so my CPU opcodes. I have here this like nice big table, as I was showing before, that I was using. Well, I, I'm actually able to look into this table at compile time. You see this table is const expert. So that means that the compiler can you know, look into this table and make decisions. And at the very bottom here, I have a whole bunch of const expert functions, like is opcode page one, is opcode page two. Um, and I have this lookup CPU op where I give it a page and an opcode and at compile time it's able to look up and return that's that CPU op which is what this table contains like this is a table of CPU ops and for each CPU op we have an opcode, the name, the addressing mode, the number of cycles it takes or the base number of cycles and the size of the instruction and what I'm interested in is this addressing mode. So here you can see I'm doing this lookup CPU op using these compile time values because these are template parameters and then getting that addressing mode. So again, a, a compile time value from this enumerator that I have at the top here. And then I take that and call read EA16. Now this is a template runtime function. So I'm saying read the effective address, that's 16 bits. And I have, oh, basically I have specializations of this guy for each addressing mode here. So one for indexed, one for extended, one for direct, which are the only ones actually that are supported. And, uh, and then for each one of these, it calls a function that knows how to read that address, that effective address, or how to build it based on the addressing mode. So 
that's pretty, pretty much the pattern that I follow. So when I call this, this is going to call, and it just really it compiles into like one function call, the right function call. And um, it's cool because basically I have these three versions of opneg being called down here, one, two, and, sorry, no, one, this one, this one, and this one. Each one of these is for a different addressing mode, but I only have one function that I have to implement and it'll just do the right thing. So it'll, it'll get the effective address, and after that, it'll read the value at that effective address through the memory bus, and I'll have this 8-bit value, and now I can now uh, do the same logic here, but I need to write it back. So actually, in that case, what I could do, I wonder why I didn't do that in some of these other places. Just thinking about how, yeah. Just thinking about refactoring and stuff. Like, it might make more sense instead of like writing reg here, you know, if I wrote value, and I know that basically I'm passing in a register, and that's fine, but it's by reference. So, like, yeah, I'll just do this. Let's put value everywhere. Let's call this a ridge value. And do that and that. Right. And then here I can just call opneg with this value here, which will actually correctly update my flags. And then I can just take the memory bus and do a write at the same address with the updated value. Yeah, I like that. And that makes more sense, less copy-paste code. I should do that actually for all these other ones because they all fit that same pattern. I'm doing the same logic everywhere. I'm doing a plus plus here and then I'm computing these later, but I could totally do this inside. Yeah, I'll do that after. Just put a little to-do in here. Um, call uh, rewrite the factor in terms of op ink u int 8 t res like op make and I'll just do that for the other ones all right so this sh hopefully compiles let's see if this compiles op neg identifier not found Oh, yeah, I have capital letters. And, and yeah, and then I need to pass it the page and the, uh, oh, yeah, does that make sense? I guess that makes sense. I, I realize I'm passing the page and the opcode for this one here, but I don't even really need to. So I'm kind of following this pattern. I guess that's all right. And maybe that's the thing. Maybe it's a bit weird. Like maybe what makes more sense is to like have like a um, kind of a helper that both call instead. Cause it's kind of weird to pass in the page and opcode to this one. Is it weird? Maybe what's weird is the fact that I pass this in and I don't need it at all. Yeah, maybe. Because I really don't need it here. I don't know. Let's leave it like this for now. Okay, it compiles. Yeah. Iteration. Now it's often the case that I don't care about the page and the opcode for instructions that deal with um, with register values. So technically speaking, I don't really need to pass these in. But maybe there are, are yeah, there are exceptions. Like here, here I have an exception. So maybe it's better to just stay consistent. Okay, 
All right. All right, let's just see if this works. So I've built everything. I'll just put some breakpoints in my op neg, see what it looks like. And I'll run my CPU and set D00D to 40. And I'll continue. So there we go. Now we actually are running negate A. So here I am, 0x40. There's my new instruction that I just added. Op neg for A, which makes sense. And here we are. So what is the value of A originally? It looks like it's 0x80. Sorry if that font's a bit small in my watch window, but it's a bit annoying to change fonts for these views. So hopefully you guys can see that. Um, but anyway, so it's basically 80. Or right, decimal, 128. So what are we doing here? We store that, we negate the value, which doesn't change, which actually makes sense. It's exactly what was written here. That note that 8016 is replaced by itself. Let me just uh, move that here. Yeah, that makes sense. Because that's the two's complement, right? That's it. Because basically, this will become. Let me just. Uh, So the two's complement of this is basically 0, 1, 0, 0, sorry, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, plus 1. And that basically brings us back to 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. So that makes sense, right? So that's 128, remains 128. Um, the overflow would be set if that was the original value. So, so that's the part I don't quite understand is why would this be considered an overflow? I would have thought that we'd overflow if it was all zeros. Because for all zeros, then it would become all ones plus one, and then we'd overflow. Hmm. I don't know. It's strange. Set if the original operand, so overflow is if, if it was this. So I guess we will get overflow here, as it says we should. We're not zero. We are not negative. No, we are. We are. Sorry, we are negative because we have a one bit here. And uh, I guess we are. We will have carry. So carry is set as well. Okay. So, okay, so that was negate A, so that was over here. And then we keep going, execute a few more instructions. Okay, that's weird. Decrement B, writes to ROM not allowed. So, let's see if this makes sense. So if we did the right thing, and this makes sense, then we would have continued to a point where we reach F, uh, F592. Let's see here, branch if plus. So I guess we were not positive or not plus. So we did not branch, we would have branched to here. Then we do neg B. So that would have been neg called again. And then BVC01. 
So it's BBC again, branch, no. BBC. Okay. Branch if overflow clear. So what is it waiting for? Branch if overflow clear. Right, branch if V is clear. By one, so the next instruction. Which it was not clear, so now it decrements B. And then that, strangely, causes a writes to ROM not allowed, which makes absolutely no sense. How could that have happened? So, okay, no, this is incorrect. 6A, 5A, now I have a, oh, yeah, there we go. <laughs> Missing a break right here. So it, 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 it ran this instruction, and but then it ran this instruction erroneously. And that's why it ended up trying to write to a piece of memory that was just garbage. All right. Put a break there. Let's try that again. Okay, continue. Set. Dude to 40, continue. Oh wow, we got quite far. That's kind of cool. So now where are we? Unhandled op ASRB. Okay, so we got to another instruction. I wonder if we're actually on the right track here. So one way I can kind of validate that is, so if I load my symbols from here, from my oh, load symbol from there, I just want to see because I can kind of cross-reference where I am. Set D00, D20, to 40 Okay, so now I have a bunch of symbols that can help me. So for example, I can see here that we've got some like VEC high score, VEC loop count, VEC music work. Let's see if I can kind of locate where we're at here. Six, effective address, VEC music, WK7. Let's see maybe if I can look for this. in the BIOS. This looks like it's referenced somewhere, so here we go. Is this where we are? Put this on the side here. Hmm. Not sure I like that wrapper on, but anyway. Okay, VEC music. Sometimes it's a bit hard to follow. Let's see how many times this is referenced. Store is store A six X. Store A. Load A3F. So it might be here. Load A Vex Expo Chance. So what is this? C854. Hmm. Not 
sure that that's it. No. Okay, what else is there? Oh, maybe this? There's a lot of these loads just before. Load AX, load AX. Hmm. Okay, maybe I'm not where I think I am. What I really need to look for is this here. No, that's it. Vec music work. I think this is what, actually what I'm looking for. This is just a computation of the effective address based on the value in X. So let's look for this. Vec music work. Um, about that. Three references to Beck music work here. No, no, it's not it. Okay, let's look for store a six comma x. Nope. How about this? Aha. This be it? Yeah. This is it. Init init music buff. Okay, that's it. So we branch to some subroutine, clear XB. So I, I bet you will see clear XB above here. Uh, that's what all of this code is. It's clearing. So we might have like a branch subroutine to clear XB above here somewhere. Clear XB. Here we go. Branch subroutine to clear XB and then when that's done it returns from the subroutine and then we're here load a uh, 3f store a 6x and then return from subroutine there okay and then where are we at I guess we could see where this is called is this called anywhere else oh yeah it's in, called in a few places so what, the next instruction is a compare D, so let's find where there would be a compare D afterwards. No, no. So maybe it's where the result of clear sound. Okay. Ah, here we go. So after init OS, we come back here to load D, check the cold start flag, compare D, vec cold flag, there we go. And then we want a branch of equal to, cold, to warm start, which is this here. Cool. This is great. So I'm totally on the right track. Store D, ink, load X, and then jump subroutine to clear score. So there's clear score. And then go to clear score, which is at F84F. F84F, awesome. All right. And then here it starts to do the clear score routine. Load DD. Store D. Store D2X. And then. Uh, and then return from subroutine. So, okay, so then we're, we're done with the clear score. So if we go back, after the start, okay, after we do the clear score, we go into here. So here, jump subroutine DP to C8. So first power up loop. This prints the Vectrex power on screen and plays the power on music. Cool. That is really cool. And so let's go to that subroutine. So it looks like that. In a, oh, then we actually return from that subroutine and continue with this load D25. 
So load the dollar sign 25, which yet corresponds to vec loop count, which is what we see here. And then we do compare D here, branch not equal. So I guess we did branch, yeah. Let's see, F209, so we did branch. So we branched down here, and there we go. ASRB, get line pattern from table. So it looks like we're on the right track. So I think this would be a good spot to check in, to push, uh, to commit and push what I've got so far. I kind of like to commit when I've got one instruction implemented. So I use uh, Git extensions to, to as my GUI for Git, which I really like. It's really a uh, nice GUI in Windows. It shows a nice little graph. You can click commit here. And I'll take a look at the diff in my in Beyond Compare. All right. So here, let me just line this up a bit. Okay, that looks good. A little to-do here. And even fixed decrement here. All right. Neg A, neg B. Implement neg CPU instruction. And fix. Fix uh, deck, deck B, falling through to, to decrement, to next. Okay, so implement neg CPU instruction and fix deck B falling through to next deck instruction. Looks good. So commit and push. Yeah, I like to, to commit often, so take a look at Git Kraken. Yeah, so you know, I even think I have it, Git Kraken. I, I tried it, but when I tried it, which was, to be fair, maybe six months ago, uh, it was full of bugs. I just had lots of issues with it, but I know it's probably worth taking a look at it again. I know they keep working on it. I've, I get emails from them regularly because I had to like you know create an account in order just to download and use it and stuff. So now I just get all this email from them about every every time they update the app. Uh, I'm sure it's good, but um, you know how it is. I'm kind of used to this one, and it's actually really good. Uh, Git extensions is open source. Uh, I've actually contributed to it, fixed a couple of bugs, um, and added some couple of features that I like. Um, has a pretty active community. It's it's being actively developed, so it's it's a pretty good tool, and I recommend it to anyone who's looking for a good GUI on on Windows. I know some people use it on Mac and on Linux. I think you can do that um, with Wine or something, but I don't really have any experience with it. Do you use uh, Git Kraken, Lucasis, Plays? If I'm saying that right. Okay, so next. So the next instruction is ASRB. Let's look that up. ASRB, so what is this? It's in one simple inherent instruction, so that shouldn't be too hard. Let's go look at my trusty 1980s manual here. ASRB. Oh, arithmetic shift right accumulator. Okay. Okay, so it's just ASR. And then we have ASR, ASRA, and ASRB. So again, there we go. Arithmetic shift right. So there's one for memory and then one for each of the accumulator and accumulators, A and B. So arithmetic shift right, 
Shifts all the bits of the operand right, right one place. Bit 7 is held constant. Bit 0 is shifted into the carry flag. Okay, just mentioning that these other processors do affect the V flag, but in our case, the overflow flag is not is not affected. And bit seven is held constant. All right, all right. So let's do that arithmetic. So we'll do ASR. One, two, is B two three. Yeah. So same pattern as usual. I'll just take this again, and put it to the right. All right. I'll stick this somewhere here. Good place as any. Case. Uh, all right. What do you got here? Zero X zero seven. So I guess we'll call this ASR. All right, I wonder if I should do like one function for right and one function for left or make one just like a shift. Okay, I'll, I'll do ASR and then we'll look at the left one afterwards. Yeah. So this is gonna be page zero, zero X, zero seven, like that. Okay, uh, 47, op ASR, 47, okay, oh, actually that's ASR A, so I'll pass an A here, ASR B is 57, Lucas's plays says, yeah, I remember that that times when it was buggy as hell, but now it's pretty much fixed. So, I mean, this is this is not free software, right? Get cracking. You, you actually have to buy a license for it. Or is it like free for for home use or something? So I know, you know, I don't mind paying for software like, um, you know, this 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 tool here, Total Commander. I think I paid like 80 bucks for it. Totally worth it. I use it all the time as like, my like Explorer uh, replacement. Um, Beyond Compare is another compare tool I paid for because it's awesome. So I mean, I don't mind paying for good software, but I just wonder, does it really? outperform and uh, get extensions and you know is it really worth it maybe okay, I can try it again the rock 67 pop ASR this is another part. no it is free but if you want special stuff, then you have to pay. I'm using it for free and it handles everything I need from Git. All right, well, you know what? I'll, uh, I'll give it a shot. At work, a lot of people use uh, SourceTree. And I really have to say, I do not like SourceTree. I find it, I don't really like the UI. I, I think it's a bit strange. It doesn't have, one of the things I really like in Git extensions, it's like the most basic thing for me, but I can click on any commit and just take a look at what the file tree looks like for that commit. And just being able to like, yeah, you know, take a look at this. You know, if I let's say I'll go earlier, you can see like, I only had three files here and, uh, and then eventually I added source with just main and source with these ones. and being able to do that or being able to even search the file tree is just so basic uh, 
but Source Tree doesn't really have that. It kind of has it in this like weird way, and it's super slow. Um, so yeah, that's the, one of the things I don't like about it. And I just find the UI a bit clunky. Maybe I'm just not used to it. But and, I, and I've heard that the one on Mac is better because it's like the native, the native version of Source Tree is developed for Mac. But at least on Windows, it's not that great. Lucas's play says, I have been using source tree, but it started to lag and took so long to commit and sometimes crashed and didn't want to start up, so I'm I am against it too. Actually, another thing I noticed about source tree, uh, because I also use git from the command line, right? And I noticed that I'll try and do something, you know, like uh, by command line, and I'll get I'll get these errors that the uh, well yeah, errors from git saying that the um, the repo's like lock file uh, is, is prohibiting me from working. And then I just try it again and it works. And it's because source tree in the background is constantly like, you know, on some timers um, running operations to query, uh, you know, do fetches in the background and query statuses and stuff. And that just keeps creating this lock on the, the repo, uh, which is super annoying, right? So if you're like running scripts and stuff like that, source tree just kind of gets in the way and I don't like that I kind of like more of a passive approach you know I'd rather the program just do absolutely nothing until I hit F5 uh, and maybe there's a way to turn that stuff off but it seems to be like the, the default in source tree oh yeah so I forgot to uh, forgot to pass my template parameters here and 00x77. Let's make sure I got that right. Okay. All right, that looks good. So let's go implement op ASR. same thing as before because it looks like I like that pattern that we had from before all right close this okay all right so let's take a copy value. Um, we want to shift it right. So let's shift it right by one. But we want to keep the value that it had. So what's that? Maybe what I'll do is I'll do like this. So value will be equal to Got to go, so good luck with your project, and I'll definitely watch, be watching your stream. Thanks a lot, Lucas's Plays. Thanks for hanging out. Appreciate it. All right, so take the original value, because I basically want to keep the top bit. So we take out that bit, and we or it with yeah that makes sense we want to or it with the value shifted right by one so that will keep whatever bit was in the top bit seven is held constant yeah Bit zero is shifted into the carry flag. Okay, so let's update our flag. So it says that the carry will be equal to whatever was in the in the basically so the zero with a bit okay, is what the carry gets. 
I think I need to say if this equals to one. Yeah. Do I need to do that? No, I don't need to do that. Okay. Negative as usual. Just copy this line actually. Negative above. Overflow is not affected. H is undefined. Uh, Z is set if all bits are clear, so usual for that. And carry loaded with bit zero of the original operand. Okay, I think that's right. And now we do the other version for memory addresses. So we look it up, get the effect of that address, read it, and now we just call the app up ASR on value, and then we write it back. So that that should be arithmetic shift right. So I think I'll do arithmetic shift left while I'm at it. Kind of makes sense. Here we go. Shifts all bits of the operand one place to the left. Bit zero is loaded with a zero. Bit seven of the operand is shifted into the carry flag. Oh, here the overflow is actually set. What is this symbol? that when I get to it so let's okay, let's start with this hop ASL arithmetic shift left and then this one we'll call arithmetic shift left and now we just need to implement this one okay so in this case it's not quite that what we want instead is to shift left one place to the left and then bit zero is loaded with a zero. Okay, so we just want to shift left in this case by one. And this time the carry flag gets bit seven of the original value. Actually, what I should do here is I should shift it right by, by seven. Wait, I think this will work. Because if it's non-zero, yeah, and it'll get a one if it's non-zero. Yeah, this is, our, this is okay. It's more consistent with what I had before, yeah. I think it should be okay. All right, and what else? So, yeah, that's done. Set of all bits are clear, that's done. So here, I just need to do overflow. Load, okay, overflow, loaded with the result of bit seven, is that XOR bit, bit eight of the original operand? Would that make sense? If one or the other was set, why would that make sense? 
because the sign would change. Yes, that's right. Okay, right. What I guess what it's saying is, so if we have this and we shift it left by one, we end up with one zero 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 like that, which means that the original value was negative and remained negative. Um, however, in the case where we have this, we went from a negative to a non-negative by shifting left, which means overflow would get set, or here we went, so yeah, so here we went from neg to pause, and here we went from positive to negative, so that's why overflow is set, whereas here we went from negative to negative, so we're okay. Okay. So overflow gets set if the original values it's one or the other, but not both. with this and if I get a non-negative value that means what does it mean and so when you know I'm getting tired ah, let's see here you know what let's ask good old trusty calc there we go. Right, so C zero. just gonna do it like in a stupid way I would say overflow gets set if only one of those bits is set Yeah, I know what we can do. We can shift left by seven, and then actually XOR it with the original value, shifted left by six. That's right. So basically, like, if I had, let's say I had, um, so I'll shift this one by seven, so, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So it puts it into this place here. And shifting like by six means taking this value and going one, two, three, four, five, six. And then we do an X or on them. Now what that means is that in this case, we would be doing one, would got this one gets shifted by seven. X or with this one getting shifted right by six. So that would be zero. And if they were both zero, it would still be zero. So that's no overflow. So that's good. Otherwise, in this case or this case, 
oops, we'd get a one XOR is zero, which is one, a zero XOR one, which is one. Okay, so yeah. Let's make a little comment here. Overflow sign change happens if bit seven or six is set, but not both, or was set, I should say. Okay. Yeah, I think that takes care of this operation. It's kind of funny how shift right keeps the high bit set. I guess that's about keeping the sign. It's an arithmetic. I guess that's what it means, arithmetic shift right. So that if it's a negative number, that's it. If it's a negative number, it remains a negative number for shift left. If it was sign extended, um, it would continue to be negative unless we get to the overflow case. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. And for the one from the memory address, oh, which I already implemented. So. All right, so I have these implemented for arithmetic shift left, and I just need to plug them into my master switch case here. So let's look for ASR. We'll add them right after ASR. So here, a little ASR, so it's arithmetic shift right. ASL, so let's go back to my table of opcodes. AS and I don't have an ASL in here because of this. Ah, because logical shift left and arithmetic shift left are the same. Interesting. And it looks like we can't do a shift left on a register, only on a memory address. Does that make sense? That might make sense. ASL A and ASL B, opcode 48. Oh, what happened? Oh, did it get cut off? That's super weird. ASL A and 58 for ASL B. Okay, so let's hook this up, ASL. So 0x08, zero zero page 0, instruction 8. I need to look into whether logical and arithmetic are really the same. It would seem so, and I guess it might make sense that the instruction behaves the same way. And I guess logical shift right probably doesn't hold a seventh bit, and that's probably the only difference. Here is LSR. Take a look at that as well while I'm on this. So ASL is here, there's also 0x48. 
and that's for inherent. And this is for the case where we pass it A, 48. Fifty-eight is for B. So fifty-eight B. Sixty-eight. So same thing as here. So that's for memory. That's for index to addressing mode. 78 for extended addressing mode. Okay. Now, before I continue, let me just take a look what they say about logical shift uh, left in here. So, LSL. Logical shift left memory location. It's tiny. Logical shift left me memory location. Uh, okay. Talking about BVS. So this is a logical shift right. Logical shift left. LSL, okay. So I just did ASL, and now it's describing ASL. So what's the difference here? It shifts all bits of accumulator X. Accumulator X, okay, yeah, okay. A or B, or memory, one place to the left. Bit zero is loaded with a zero. Bit seven is shifted into the carry. This is a duplicate assembly language mnemonic for the single machine instruction ASL. Okay, so there we go. It's exactly the same, that makes sense. So they just kind of copy paste it. Now let's look at ASR. Arithmetic shift right. Where is this description here? Here we go. All right, shifts all bits of the operand right, right one place. Bit seven is held. Con oh, sorry, no, not. I didn't want to look up ASR. I want to look up L, logical shift right, LSR. Okay, here we go. Logical shift right performs a logical shift right on the operand. Shifts a zero into bit seven, and bit zero into the carry flag. The 6800 processor also affects the V flag. That's not for us. So yeah, it's exactly as I suspected. Since it's logical and not arithmetic it doesn't care about keeping the sign it's not it's an instruction you would use um, you would not use this on for for arithmetic so really the only difference is it's very minor is um, that I just want to make sure I write this here is that we don't have to worry about holding bit 7 when we do it so this here is really logical shift left and arithmetic shift left but let's do the logical shift right LSR 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 isn't that uh, the uh, elvish name for Aragorn LSR King or something. Okay. Case zero x zero four. So this will be op LSR. Logical shift right. Page zero. Instruction four. LSR A is 44. Zero X 44. 
four. This is for A. 54 is for B. Next is 64. And finally, 74. Let's go up to our arithmetic shift right here. So super, super similar to this one. In fact, it's like pretty much exactly like this one, except for this. So yeah, let's, let's do this. We'll copy ASR. We'll put logical shift right and logical shift right here. And we'll just take this one off. I think that's it. Let me just double check. Logical shift right. H is not affected. Uh, N is cleared. Wait, that's interesting. Oh yeah, of course. Since we're always shifting right, any any bit in the seventh position will necessarily get shifted right, so we can just clear it, technically speaking. Bit seven, always shifted right. Shift it out. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. Um, said, set if all bits of the results are clear. Yeah, we're zero in that case. Overflow not affected, and carry flag is loaded with bit zero of the original operand, which is exactly what we've got here. So, okay, so kind of worth having a separate instruction for that then. And then op LSR for the same thing, except you must call op LSR here. Okay. I actually think that takes care of all of those. All right. Let's see if this builds. What do we got here? All oh, right, yeah. Gotta pass my template parameters when I call this function here. I guess same thing here. Yeah, page and off code. Compile. Not the same thing here. Page and off code. And there we go. Builds. So let's see how far we get. Load symbols. Those symbols. Okay, let's get those symbols loaded. Copy full path here. And let's run. Stop here. Gotta set my value in dude. Dude. And then we're looking for, I know we're looking for 40 in there. Let's continue. All right. 
and unhandled op and B. Okay. So there's our ASR B. Is this where we were before? I think so. Let's see. Should have written down some addresses in here. Would have been useful. LF029. Oh yeah, okay, that's cool. 029 corresponds to the 029 that we have here. Okay, that's useful. Uh, so yeah, that's it. Next instruction. So get line pattern from B was arithmetic shift right B. So actually, you know, what would be really interesting is to see arithmetic shift right in action. So let's let's mark down this. Um, okay, let's take down this line here. So I just remember that it was at this address, and let's let's start again. And let's say run until. I'm gonna get stuck here. Now I think I have, this means I set breakpoints, right? Yeah, I basically set a breakpoint here. This is a, when I do run until, it actually adds a temporary breakpoint. And once it hits that breakpoint, it'll automatically disable or delete the, the breakpoint. So that's how I implemented the until instruction. Um, so yeah, I just gotta set dude. to 40 okay so here we are we're about to do an arithmetic sh arithmetic shift right on B so let's take a look at what B looks like well, B is 0 so not interesting at all right B is still 0 of course Anything interesting happen with flags? Well, the negative got set. Negative is not set, I mean. Zero is set in this case, which makes sense. And overflow is not touched. Okay. And then the next instruction will um, stop on unhandled op, because I have not yet done and b. Is that true? I thought I had done the AND instruction, but I suppose I haven't. Let's take a look. I think I don't have an OP AND. No, I don't. Okay. That's right. Um, CPU OP codes AND. AND CC AND A AND A. Okay, this is a bit more interesting. There's a few more options. You can end the carry, the control codes, I mean, A and B. Okay. With an address, right. Sedated Snail says, looks like a cool project. I'm excited to see it when it's fully operational. Uh, thanks, uh, Sedated Snail. Uh, yeah, yeah, me too. I'm anxious to get to a point where I'm actually rendering something. Um, yeah, this implementing the CPU is interesting, but you know, obviously it's, it's not a lot of visuals. Uh, so, you know, at least I have the debuggers it's, and it's got colors, right? Colors are cute, but yeah, it's, uh, it's going to be cooler once I start to actually render vector graphics and get some audio working. Anyway, I, I, I do work on this off stream, so try to make some progress there. I'm not only working on this on stream, which uh, I think would take a really long time. Oh, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. So I think I'm, I'm ready to commit the changes I made. So bring up, bring up Git extensions here. a look quickly. So I've done ASR, LSR, and ASL. And then here are the calls. Right. Okay. So implement ASR, LSL, ASL, and LSR. Right. 
logical shift right, CPU instructions. Commit and, oh yeah, I gotta stage my files, stage all, commit and push. Oh, hey, Alvaro. How's it going? Okay, so just push that change. It's not so bad. It'd be good to kind of get a sense for how many instructions I've actually implemented. Yeah, I think I could do that. Let's let's try to figure out like how many of these I've actually implemented. So I think simplest way would be to kind of count how many cases I have in this file and compare that to the number of, of these in the tables here. That should give me a pretty good idea of what I've got. So let's do that. So let's say I uh, find in the current document all case 0x. There we go. So I have 178 here. And in my opcodes, I guess do the same kind of search. So here, let's do that. Find 0x. I mean, I guess I could do that. Yeah. Oh, I wanted to keep my 303. I think it was 178, 303. Let's just try to make sure. I want to do append results. I uh, know, that's not right. Case. Current document, find all. Okay. So 178 out of 303. All right, not bad, about 60% uh, of instructions. Alvaro says, all good, doing some work. We'll hang out here. That looks complicated <laughs> with, with a little tear. Oh, there's no need to, to be sad. It's all good. It's not that bad. Honestly, emulators are not uh, they're not as hard as, as people think. I think I think emulators were really hard to implement, like back in the day when you know computers were much slower. So you know I remember I remember back in like I don't know like ninety eight ninety nine or whatever when uh, when uh, emulators for like Nesticle came out to emulate the the NES, and that that that, that emulator would run like full speeds, you know, 60 FPS on my like, I think it was like a Pentium 1 or whatever, first Pentium computer. And that was just nuts. Like Windows 95, Windows 98 era. Um, but today, you know, today you don't have to be, you know, like back then you like did write hand coded assembly, make sure it's like super fast. Uh, today, you don't have to be uh, as careful. I mean, you do still need to have your eye on performance, obviously, but you know the beefy machines we have today, it's not so bad. So yeah, I think my next instruction was to start implementing the AND instruction, but you know what, I think I think I'm gonna call it a night. Kind of tired now. It's 11:30 over here. So uh, I know Alvaro, you just joined, but uh, I think yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call it a night. Been streaming for a couple hours and got some good work done. So everyone, and on stream, thanks for hanging out. And I hope you, uh, I hope to see you guys next time I stream. So yeah, take care everyone.